Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, December 22nd. Here is some of what we're talking about tonight. Millions of Americans are preparing to travel for the holidays despite the Omicron variant. We'll consider how to stay positive and careful at the same time. One reason for hope, the FDA approved the first at-home COVID treatment, a pill, not an injection. Also, the president extends the federal pause on student loan debt. That could go a long way, but what more needs to be done? Plus, how will NASA spend Christmas Day? Hopefully launching the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Two NASA researchers behind the project will introduce us to it. And good luck trying to buy the latest video game consoles. We'll explain why the new systems from Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo are still so very hard to find. Well, perhaps you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed by all of this Omicron-related news, especially now with cases surging, just as many of us are about to mix households for the holidays. AAA estimates that more than 109 million people will travel over the next week and a half, myself included. Air travel could nearly triple from last year. Add me to that group. I'm off to see my family. So how do we all travel safely alongside millions of our fellow Americans? Well, the CDC's director addressed that during a White House update today. I know there are a lot of questions about the Omicron variant, how to protect yourselves, our loved ones, how to safely gather with our families and friends over the holidays. Get vaccinated. Get boosted. Wear a mask in public indoor settings in areas of substantial and high-risk community transmission and take a test before you gather. Getting tested to ensure that you're not spreading the virus is a big one. Unfortunately, in many places, that's easier said than done. But some cities and states are doing what they can to help. In New Jersey, residents can now order COVID test kits to their homes. If you live in New Jersey, you can go to learn.vaulthealth.com slash NJ. Again, learn.vaulthealth.com slash NJ. In Washington, D.C., residents can get an at-home rapid test kit at any of the district's 36 public libraries. Meanwhile, the White House has announced plans for new testing sites starting here in New York this week. The administration plans to ship 500 million rapid tests for free starting next month. Demand for tests is outpacing supply, and some folks are understandably anxious. Let's see if we can't ease some of that anxiety with some clarity on what to do. Joining us now is NBC News medical contributor Dr. Vin Gupta. He's a critical care pulmonologist and a faculty member at the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Dr. Gupta, welcome. Good to see you again. Great to be with you, Joshua. Thank you for having me. From the briefing today, it sounds like the guidance for those of us who are traveling is kind of the same as the guidance that we've always gotten. Like, I didn't hear anything magical in the briefing today that would make me go, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Are, are you seeing any guidance or recommendations for people traveling over the holidays that's at all remarkable or different than what we've been told all along? Honestly, no. Uh, and, and which is which is actually refreshing, in my opinion. So we don't have oh, constantly have to pivot our messaging. That if you're triple vaccinated, that if you are following everything that all your viewers already know, I'm going to say, but high quality masking, vigilance when you're in the airport, um, and then if you're visiting someone that say grandma, grandpa or has cancer, somebody with a high risk medical condition, if you can get your ax hands on a test to test yourself on arrival. I mean, that is the paradigm here that we've had for the last year for safe travel, safe engagement, even more important with Omicron, given how its contagiousness, Joshua. And yet that is the guidance here. I'm traveling with my four-year-old son just a few days. I feel very comfortable because I think we're now entering a different reality, which I'm glad we're having to embrace. This is the silver lining of the Omicron variant, that no vaccine is going to prevent positive or is going to prevent a positive test for mild illness. It's only going to keep you out of the hospital. So with that, sense of what vaccines against contagious respiratory viruses can do, along with all, right. the, all the other mitigation measures, you should feel free to go see loved ones for mental health. 
With regard to that, let me get to a question we got from one of our viewers. And granted, there are many permutations of this situation. You should do what's best for your family and, of course, consult your family's physician for precise guidance for your situation. With all of that sure. said, I wonder if you could respond to a viewer named Dan who wrote, My family is currently on vacation domestically while I am home working remotely. Our plan was to gather for Christmas upon their return. We are all fully vaxxed and boosted. However, should I be concerned or delay our celebration considering Omicron? Maybe celebrate masked? Dr. Gupta, what would you tell Dan? I would tell Dan to keep his plans because we know that there is a likelihood that at some point, Dan and his family, they may get exposed to Omicron. They may even test positive and that it's OK, because now we have this, uh, we have emerging certainty here that the vaccines, three of them, are going to prevent any degree of serious illness leading to the hospital, exactly what these vaccines should be doing. And so I would, I would with that acceptance, again, with that psychological shift, just in six months, we've gone from saying these vaccines aren't going to prevent a positive test to, you know what, they're going to keep you out of the hospital. Accepting that reality, which is the right reality, um, should allow Dan to keep his plans without any delay. I just want to note, by the way, before we move on, what you're talking about has to do with people who are vaccinated. If you are unvaccinated, you are still in a world of trouble as it relates to COVID because the Delta variant is not gone. The Omicron variant spreads much more readily and you're still statistically at a vastly higher risk of hospitalization and death. We're talking about people who are vaccinated, right? Absolutely. And I think that is, I'm so glad you brought that up, Joshua, because if you go to any media website right now, some of them are citing studies suggesting that Omicron is mild. And I think that's actually quite premature and we need to qualify that statement. That sure, it looks like it's mild, primarily amongst those that are fully vaccinated, three doses in. But what we also know is that this virus can rapidly accumulate in the respiratory tract, in your nose and in your lungs. And typically speaking, for a virus as contagious, as lethal as COVID, more virus in the nose and the lungs means badness, means likelihood of ending up in the hospital. That happens to those that are unvaccinated. So this only applies to the vaccinated. If you're unvaccinated, you are taking a serious risk, multiple fold higher than the original version of the virus, multiple fold higher than the risk you had that COVID posts you back in March of 2020. I do want to ask you about COVID testing because a lot of travelers have been rushing to get tested and have really struggled to do so. I just got a note on my computer just now that one of the at-home COVID test giveaways in the city of Philadelphia has been canceled because they are out of testing kits. So Philly folks, if you're planning to go to the Waterview Recreation Center tomorrow to try to get a testing kit, they are out, but they are still doing the vaccine clinic there for those of you in Philadelphia. What do you tell people who are trying to go to community clinics, to you know, CVS, to Rite Aid, to try, to try to buy one off the shelf, and they just can't get one, but they're still trying to do the right thing. I would. Uh, this is when it's really important to pay attention to your body. Do you have symptoms of a head cold? If you're triple vaccinated and you can't test yourself, but let's say you, you did come down with Omicron, it seems like head cold, sore throat, runny nose, the typical stuff that you'd experience cold and flu, those are the symptoms. So pay attention to your body, your symptoms, Make sure you got that boost. Within 20, you get a benefit within 48 hours. So if you're about to board a flight, you haven't gotten boosted, get that booster, still some benefit. And make sure if you're visiting someone who's high risk and you can't get access to a test, so if they're over 65 or have cancer or on dialysis, a really narrow set of conditions, that they have got their, that they are two weeks out from their third shot at least. That's vital. If you can't guarantee that and you can't test yourself and you're seeing somebody that's high risk, that's when I would reconsider your plans. But if those individuals you're visiting who are high risk or three doses in and you're doing all the right things, I think you can safely visit them. One last story I wanted to get to with you, not related to COVID, but a re really remarkable breakthrough that I think more people need to know about, which is a recent uh, approval by the FDA of a medication that can help in the fight against HIV, an injection that can help people stave off HIV infection. This sounds like a gigantic development. You know, it's the holy grail of public health. I mean, this is, we would be talking about it endlessly if we weren't in a respiratory pandemic. Glad you brought it up. It's called Operitude. That is the trade name. It's developed by a combination of biotechnology companies led by GlaxoSmithKline. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about this. It's an every two month injection. 
which is fantastic because the big reason why the pre-exposure prophylaxis medications we have available for individuals at high risk of contracting HIV, uh, right now, those medications are daily medications, Joshua. So adherence with the daily medication to prevent something is tough. So only 25% of people who would actually qualify for those medications are actually prescribed it. A lot of them are not taking it every day. So this is really going to revolutionize prevention for HIV amongst high-risk groups. This is a once-every-two-month injection, really extraordinary. Well, I definitely would like to talk more about this in the future. I, I remember when PrEP first kind of started with Truvada, another medication called Descovy, which does work amazingly well at preventing HIV infection. So I'm eager to see what this injection turns into. Dr. Vin Gupta, always good to see you. Thank you very much. And by the way, if you are Thank looking you. to get vaccinated, we can point you to the info that you need. Grab your phone, open the camera app, and scan the QR code on your screen right now. That will take you to our site, planyourvaccine.com. You can do it quickly, quietly. No one needs to know but you and your doctor. Doesn't have to be a political statement. Just get it done to protect the people around you and to protect yourself. Scan the QR code right now or go to planyourvaccine.com. Still to come, the Biden administration is keeping federal student loan payments on pause for a few more months. How much will this help borrowers across the country and how much more help will they need? We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. For some of us, the Omicron variant has added another layer of anxiety, as if this pandemic was not unnerving enough. Today, President Biden announced more relief to ease the financial stress for millions of Americans. The Biden administration is extending its moratorium on federal student loan payments. The original end date of January 31st will be pushed back to May 1st. This extended pause affects about 41 million borrowers. Now, until the last few days, the White House was pretty adamant that this moratorium would not be extended. But today, Press Secretary Jen Psaki said many factors caused this reversal, including Omicron. Millions of people across the country are still uh, struggling with the ongoing threat of the pandemic. Uh, many of them are student loan borrowers. Um, this is something the president's thought a lot about over the last several days uh, in coordination and course conjunction and discussions with the vice president. Check out the big picture of federal student loans. Nearly 43 million people owe an average of $37,000 for their federal loans. So what is the impact of today's announcement? And where does the president stand on his campaign pledge to cancel some student loan debt? Let's get into that with NBC senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor. Sahil, I wonder what the expectation is of how much of a dent this move is going to make. I mean, there was a survey last month in which one in five Americans said that they would never be financially secure enough to resume paying their student loans. One in five. How much of a dent does the administration think that this will make in the overall student loan problem? Well, it's a Band-Aid, Joshua. Ultimately, this is three more months in a pause on student loan payments uh, for federally backed loans that have not been being made since uh, 2020, since the pandemic hit. Now, even before COVID-19 hit, uh, millions of borrowers were stranded under a massive amount of student loan debt. It was already seen as a crisis then. I think the pandemic uh, forced the government's hand in ensuring that it would provide at least some relief. It looks like that relief will be extended for a few months. But beyond that, the White House seems to be signaling that it's going to uh, have to resume. What about doing more, taking more steps? There had been pressure, a letter that was sent to the president this month from Senators Chuck Schumer of New York and Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts and Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, all calling on him to cancel student loan debt. But that sounds like something he's been mostly resisting. That's correct. And the notable name there is Chuck Schumer. It's not just progressives like Elizabeth Warren and Ayanna Presley on this. It is the majority leader of the United States Senate that is calling on President Biden to use his executive authority to cancel up to $50,000 in student debt. It's Warren who believes, uh, based on research that she's done, uh, you know, based on her advisors, that the president has the authority to do that. Biden has been resistant to that. What the White House has said is that they're willing to cancel up to $10,000 of student debt if Congress passes a bill and sends him that bill. Beyond that, 
the White House uh, has not been willing to die on this hill politically. I was just going to ask you about that. So that $10,000 student debt cancellation, that's still potentially on the table. The, the president has not backed away from that, right? Correct. The president has not backed away from that. And the White House's attitude has been, if Congress sends him that bill, he will sign it. But advocates are faulting him for not leaning in more heavily on this issue, for not uh, pressuring Congress to do it, for not using uh, or really exploring his executive authority to cancel student debt uh, to a greater extent than he already has done. And, and look, part of this is the tricky politics of the situation. You know, this issue is roped up in generational resentment. There are people who might have just paid off their student debt who will suddenly see uh, a bunch of others getting relief that they don't get. There are a bunch of older uh, Americans who either didn't go to college or uh, don't want to see the money spent in this manner. And the, the frank reality is that the, most of the people who are facing large amounts of student debt are millennials and Gen Z. Uh, voters, and they don't vote in nearly as big numbers as older voters. If they did, I suspect that there would be a clamor between lawmakers to compete over who can cancel more student debt. Yeah, and I think some of those boomers should probably compare their bills to the bills that millennials and Gen Zers are paying for college. It would make you gag the amount of money that young people have to pay to get the same education that some folks, especially in places like California with the UC system, got pretty much for free. So the economics are not the same. But that kind of gets to what Vice President Kamala Harris was asked this weekend on Face the Nation in terms of what the administration might do more broadly. Here's part of what she said. But do you think you need to deliver on that promise before 2022? Which promise? On debt forgiveness for student loans. Well, I think that we have to continue to do what we're doing to figure out how we can creatively re relieve the pressure that students are feeling because of their student loan debt. Yes. That sounded kind of like she was ducking the question. I mean, creatively relieve the pressure. What does that mean? It sounded cryptic to me as well. She did not identify exactly what they would do. And this has sort of been a pattern for the White House, for the Biden administration, is that when they get asked about this, they do respond favorably. They sympathize with uh, you know people who have huge amounts of student debt. They say they want to do more to act on it. They say they'll sign a bill if Congress sends it to them. But at the end of the day, it is unclear what executive actions President Biden is going to take beyond this additional 90-day moratorium, which, by the way, only applies to federally backed student loans. There are lots of other people who have private student loans who, who have been required to make their payments according to their lenders uh, since the pandemic hit, who are not getting any relief uh, from this current effort, and who people like Elizabeth Warren say the government should do more to try to cancel their student debt as well. So there's a lot potentially on the table for the White House. They don't want to be dismissive of this issue, but it's not been an, a focal point for them either. Before I have to let you go, the president in his address today also had a message to borrowers and asked them to, in his words, do their part and mentioned what borrowers can do to prepare for when these payments finally resume. Before I let you go, what about the other pieces of this equation, both the people who have borrowed money to pay for their educations and the other lenders who are processing these loans? Any expectations about specifically what they should do? I think the president is signaling that that is going to have to resume, that the, that the government putting a pause on this is not going to last forever, that borrowers should uh, prepare to start having to make those payments again to the government. And everyone who has private loans, they have to, they have to check with their bank, they have to check with their lender in terms of what uh, possible relief they have, because uh, at this point, it is not clear if any further relief is coming from the government. Joshua. Thank you, Sahil. That's NBC senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor reporting tonight. Still ahead, NASA is calling it an Apollo moment. A new telescope could revolutionize our understanding of the universe, and it's set to launch on Christmas morning. You'll meet two of the scientists behind this landmark device just ahead. Stay close. Our best present this Christmas might come from NASA, a telescope like the world has never seen, designed to look deeper into the universe than ever. It's as big as a tennis court, as heavy as a school bus. Remember the Hubble? Well, this one, the James Webb Space Telescope, is said to be a hundred times more powerful, and it will orbit the sun. But the Hubble has taught us a lot in its 30 years of orbiting the Earth. Three, two, one, and look.
liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. We will be probing the time of the earliest history of the universe. a century later, the space telescope that bears Hubble's name gives us our most up-to-date estimate of the number of observable galaxies in the universe. Ultimately, as is the case with all voyages of discovery, its greatest contribution will be the unexpected breakthrough that brings completely new knowledge. Very cool. Joining us now are two scientists who had big roles in developing the new telescope. Dr. John Mather is senior project scientist on the project. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006. And Dr. Begonia Vila is a systems engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. She is in French Guiana for the launch. Thank you both for making time for us. Welcome to you both. Glad to have you on the program. Dr. Mather, let me start with you and try to get at what we've learned from the Hubble and how we hope to advance it with the James Webb. As we mentioned, the Hubble was instrumental in our, in our understanding of and discovery of dark matter in 2006. Talk about what dark matter is and how the how the James Webb might add to that research. Sure, and dark matter is a substance that astronomers can uh, detect the presence of, but we can never see. As far as we can tell, it's completely transparent, but it has gravity and it's very important to us because from our story of the expanded universe, we believe it's the reason we are here. In other words, uh, dark matter started moving soon after the beginning of the expansion of the universe, and it formed the objects that were going to lead to galaxies. So we are here in person today because dark matter started the process of forming galaxies a long time ago. So we will be looking at that and looking for the effects of that dark matter. Dr. Vila, what about the James Webb Telescope itself? The Hubble needed some servicing around 1994, and it made a big impact in terms of the quality of the images that it sent back. What's the plan in terms of, you can see the difference, the before and then after the first repair mission. What's the preparation been like for preparing for potential repairs for the James Webb? Well, um, Hubble uh, is orbiting the Earth, so as you said, uh, it was possible to do repairs. Uh, James Webb is going to be one million miles away, four times the distance of the moon. So we cannot repair it. So a lot of the effort on James Webb has been uh, a very thorough test campaign on the ground to make sure that it is going to work as it should. And one advantage it has over Hubble is that the big mirror of James Webb, which is made of 18 smaller mirrors that we can fold to fit in the rocket, has actuators on the back. So uh, we will not have the same problem that Hubble had. And if we, if we did, we know how to correct it. Uh, real time, uh, on the ground. Dr. Mather, another area in which the Hubble telescope mm -hmm. advanced our understanding was the age of the universe. How does the James Webb factor into that? Is it kind of connected to what you were talking about with dark matter and understanding the forces that began to move after the beginnings of the formation of the universe, or is there more to it than that? Oh, there's more to it than that. Uh, the Hubble was used to detect the fact that the universe is accelerating, expanding faster and faster every day. And we expect to measure that uh, effect on, but much better with the Webb telescope because we can see farther back in time and we can see the infrared light that helps us see those uh, special marker stars that are called supernovae that we use to measure distances. 
So we expect to get a better measurement of this, but it's gotten very interesting in the recent years because now we have more than one way to measure the expansion rate and we're not getting the same answer every time. So something's out there, something very mysterious. Dr. V, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I, I, was, I thought I'd cut you off there, sorry. But Dr. Vila, there's also something on the Hubble telescope, that, or excuse me, on the James Webb telescope. I don't know why I'm confusing these two. The Hubble is the old one, the James Webb is the new one. I know that. And there is something on the new telescope, the James Webb, that the Hubble did not have, and that is cryogenic and vacuum testing that that didn't have here on Earth. Why were those important to add? Uh, so James Webb is going to be in a space, so we need to have it in vacuum, but uh, James Webb is going to be looking at the universe with these new eyes and a uh, different wavelength, which is the infrared, which you can think of kind of like heat. So to be able to detect the signal of the objects uh, that are emitting that light, uh, we need to be able to pull everything else, otherwise we wouldn't see it. Uh, and to do that, we have to go to these very cold temperatures. Uh, James Webb is going to be at 40 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero, minus 383 Fahrenheit. Uh, we do that uh, by having a sun field, uh, which is kind of like a big umbrella that we can open up so the instruments and the mirrors are on the shade and are very cold. So it was very important on the testing on the ground that we duplicated those conditions of cold and vacuum uh, to demonstrate that everything will work on orbit as it should, and, and we had done that. Dr. Mather, let me ask you about something that always comes up when it comes to doing space-based research, and that is the cost to taxpayers. According to the Government Accountability Office, which is sort of the investigative arm of Congress, the cost of the James Webb Telescope will be around $9.7 billion. The project's costs have nearly doubled over time. The launch date had been delayed by over seven years. Obviously, this is highly sophisticated science, so it's got to be done right. You literally get one shot at putting this thing into space. Talk about the cost, the work hours, the time involved, and the benefit to the American people of doing this kind of space science, especially if some of the results of this science may not come back in my lifetime. Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, I can tell you where all the time and money went. It's to make this incredibly difficult thing work. Uh, we had to invent 10 different new technologies to make this project work. We had to get the ways to make those mirrors. We had to figure out how to focus the telescope after launch. We had to figure out how to make that gigantic sun shield that's as big as a tennis court. Uh, we had to get better infrared detectors than we ever had before. So we had to invent things before we could even finish the design. Uh, then, of course, after you've got the design, you have to prove that it works, and it takes just forever to do the proper kind of test, uh, especially if it doesn't work right the very first time, when things hardly ever do. So it takes about 10,000 people for this period of time of over 20 years to do this project. So that's what it takes to do this, and as far as we know, there is no other way to get this kind of information. We need a big telescope to be able to see far back in time, far out in space, to see inside those dust clouds where new stars are being born today, and even to see planets uh, as they go in front of their little stars out there and to begin to find out uh, are there planets that are a little bit like Earth out there, and we hope so. So right. the benefits like to the public, well, huge. I yeah. love it when people complain about, about the benefits to of space science. Yeah, I love it when people complain about the benefits of space science, and they do it on a device that requires GPS, that requires satellites that depended on space science to fling them up into orbit. So there's that. Before I have to let you two go, Dr. Vila, is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to learning from this telescope, any projects you'll be involved with, or just any big questions that you would like this telescope to help answer? Uh, I think it's, it has a very lofty goal on all science, you know, looking at those first galaxies and the stars that were formed, uh, looking for the atmosphere around those exoplanets. And uh, about six months after launch, we will have uh, an example of what all the instruments on James Webb are able to do. And I think all the science goals are very worthwhile. So I think on my side, I'm looking forward to all of them, seeing all those images and spectra and see what's out there in this uh, new way of looking uh, at the universe around us. 
And Dr. Mather, briefly before we go, anything in particular else, anything else that you're looking forward to learning? Well, I think there are going to be some surprises out there. I don't know what there would be, or I would be proposing to look for them. Uh, but uh, we've got a crowd of uh, thousands of astronomers that know what they're going to look at, and we hope they find something that nobody knew about. I think there'll be something. That is a great answer. I want to know the thing that I don't even know to ask about. That is a fabulous answer, and I am very, very much looking forward to seeing what this telescope teaches us about who we are in the universe. Dr. John Mather and Dr. Begonia Vila, we appreciate you both making time for us tonight. Thank you very much, and good luck with the launch, with the launch on Saturday. Up next, they are among the hottest items on Christmas lists this year and almost impossible to find without paying a huge markup. The PS5, the Xbox Series X, and the Nintendo Switch gaming consoles will get some tips on finding one without getting ripped off when we come back. Christmas came early for me, right around Halloween. Sony finally sent me a link to buy a PlayStation 5. Ah, but I got lucky. Right now, lots of people are clamoring for the newest gaming consoles. According to an industry trade group, nearly 227 million people in the U.S. play some kind of video games. That includes smartphone users. The average age of a gamer? 31. A number of PS5 games tell incredibly rich stories. Same for the Xbox and the Switch. Because some tales can only be told interactively. And some games cost as much to make as a Hollywood blockbuster. None of which matters unless you can get your hands on a console, right? But there's more behind this backlog than congested supply chains. That is why some folks are finding ways around the shortages. And others are getting scammed. The latest gaming consoles came out more than a year ago, but purchasing a PlayStation 5, an Xbox Series X, or an updated Nintendo Switch has only gotten harder. The key reason? A global shortage of chips for all kinds of computers. Demand skyrocketed because everybody in you know, the accounting department, for example, in an office suddenly needed a laptop. They couldn't use their desktop that was you know, stored at the office. So demand went up for the basic parts, whether the silicon or the semiconductors, that those basic parts, although they're not the same chips inside the video game consoles, they just, that, that basic element was in demand. New gaming consoles have the same benefits of any new computer. Vastly improved graphics, faster speeds, bigger internal hard drives, and more memory. Plus, exclusive games from Microsoft for the Xbox and Sony for the PlayStation. But the CEO of chipmaker AMD says that supplies will remain tight through this year and probably into early next year. Of course, the pandemic is also a factor. Back in June, a Taiwanese supplier for Apple warned that without a proper vaccine rollout, this shortage would continue. Despite all of this, the PS5 and Xbox Series X are the fastest selling game systems in history. As of this summer, Sony said it had sold 10 million consoles. Back in September, a report by Ampere Analysis said that 6.7 million Series Xs had been sold. But the Switch has reigned supreme for nearly three years. Nintendo sold more than a million units just in November. So how are some consumers getting these products? Many are turning to Twitter. We're about to go live in a minute, so I'm going to send out a tweet. And that tweet, you can click on the links. Boom. Matt Swider helps his followers keep track of when and where to find consoles. The PS5 can sell out in a second, just one second, a blink of an eye. But scammers are also cashing in on this frenzy. I usually have 15 followers a day who get scammed. Even though I put up all these warning messages, people are just really eager to get a PlayStation 5. And they're willing to just say, you know what, like 550 I'm going to spend that because it seems like a good deal when it's actually not. Some resellers are charging customers high markups. Others are reportedly just stealing their money. Last year, after the PS5 came out, many consumers in the UK said that they received air fryers or some other home goods instead of their consoles. The scammers are very, very convincing. They'll even do a thing where they write, if you're unsure, they'll write your name on a piece of paper and put it against a PlayStation 5 box and say, this is your PlayStation. And people believe that. As for the shortages, neither Sony nor Nintendo responded to our requests for comments. A statement from Microsoft said that it's trying to keep up with demand by speeding up production and shipping.
Perhaps the best way to save your money is to just be patient. Trusted retailers are still selling these consoles. So are Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft. You may have to wait weeks or months, but at least you know you'll get what you paid for. Let's continue now with Jake Randall. He's a YouTuber and video streamer who tracks PS5 and Xbox Series X availability. Jake, welcome to the program. Thank you, Joshua. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I wonder how well some of the people are that you interact with who are just tearing their hair out to try to get one well, of these consoles. I feel super privileged that I was able to find a PS5 and buy one directly from Sony, but I'm sure that is not most people's experiences, is it? Well, yeah, that, and that's amazing, and, and you're right. I, I would say that the people that follow me are probably at one of two extremes right now. They're probably either in your boat and, and very, very happy, or they're in a place where they're super frustrated right now because it's obvious it's been over a year since the ps5 has come out and some some months it's harder to get than during the launch month still a, a year later so it's it's obviously especially leading up to christmas when there's so much pressure on you know parents and and you know other people trying to get gifts for loved ones um it's just yeah exactly what you said it makes people you know tear their hair out almost what are you hearing from people who are able to find one of these consoles in terms of whether they got what they paid for just from a gaming perspective? You know, there were a lot of expectations on all these consoles before they came out. Some have been met, some have not been met. What are you hearing? Well, so I hear basically everyone that, that gets one loves it. But, you know, the, the flip side of that is, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, people that have sometimes been trying for a year or months trying to get one, they're kind of probably in that honeymoon phase a little bit where they're just so happy to get it. It's just, you know, it's everything. Um, but in general, um, I, I got my PS5 on launch day during during one of my live streams, and I still love it. My favorite thing about it is the controller. Um, I think the DualSense oh, controller yes. is... Yeah, I was going to ask, yes. you know, if, when you play Astro's Playroom, which comes with the PS5, uh -oh. the, the first time you yes. boot it up... Yeah. It's so fun. So, it's so fun. It's it, like, if, if for those of you who are watching, if you've ever fired a firearm, you know there's that little bit of resistance before the trigger comes all the way back. The triggers on the new controller for the PS5 can, on the fly, provide that resistance. So if you pull the trigger back, maybe it'll kind of oscillate to give you a kind of like a go, 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 like a machine gun effect. Or it'll give you a little resistance before you pull the trigger all the way back. On the fly. It is so cool. I'm sorry. Right. I I, my, my favorite part was... Uh, when you're walking through the rain in, in that game and you can like feel the raindrops in your hands, like, and they're all different, yes. like consistencies and, and weights. It, it was just, yeah. yeah. So it, it's very, it's, very it's, cool technology. It's kind of crazy. It, it's pretty bananas. Talk about how you are helping people both get consoles and not get scammed in the hunt for them. So, yeah. Uh, so the way I help people is I only help them buy directly from major retailers. So, you know, the, the five biggest retailers that sells them, that, that everyone knows that, that has them in stock the most would be like GameStop, Amazon, Best Buy, Target, Walmart, right? Everyone knows those. So those are the ones I focus on. Um, but, you know, other smaller retailers as well and like membership clubs like Sam's Club or, or Costco, pretty much anywhere legitimate that's an authorized retailer for the console, I help people get it from them. And the way I do that is I have... Um, almost like sleeper cell networks of employees uh, that work at these different retailers that will leak to me uh, the inventory counts, um, when upcoming restocks will happen, all this kind of information. And I, I put that out on Twitter. And then, of course, the big thing that I do is the second a restock happens, I tweet that out as well with the links. And... Um, What's great about Twitter, what's Twitter's kind of the reason, you know, that you guys just mentioned it in your piece, people have been using it to get consoles is because it's one of the only apps where if you're following someone on Twitter with notifications on, it will push the alert to your phone almost like a text right. message. So you right. you need to know right away when it comes in stock and Twitter allows that to happen. I'm not like affiliated with Twitter or whatever. I actually didn't even make a Twitter till last year, till 2020. Um and so, and then I found how, how good it could be for that reason. And then the other thing I do is, obviously, even if you're lucky enough to, to know when a restock happens, it's still almost impossible sometimes to buy them online. Your experience with PlayStation Direct, 
is one of the better ones because it puts you in a queue system. So you don't have to be super fast necessarily. You just have to be lucky to get through the queue. And that's that's a right. good way to go about it because it stops the bots from getting through because they get put in the queue as well. So they can't check out Lightning fast because they'll get a random spot in line essentially. But because some of the other retailers are difficult, they all have their little quirks. So because of that, on my YouTube channel, I make buying guides specific to the retailers as well. Yeah. That walk One more you thing through I, in about I want, 10 minutes or less. One more thing I wanted to make sure I asked you was why this was important to you to, to help people do this. I understand you have a very special personal reason for being involved in this. Yeah, and, and thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so the way I got into doing this was a year ago when the PS5 came out, I wanted to get one. <laughs> So I decided to live stream it um, during pre-order time and it, it just blew up. And I not only got it, but I helped so many other people get it. And then from that moment on, I kind of latched onto it. And the reason why is, uh, like you said, I have cystic fibrosis. Um, so when I was born, my life expectancy was 10 years old. And it's gone up as I've gotten older. Two years ago though, I, I almost, died and right after I was in the hospital for over a month I spent about half my 20s in a hospital bed because I would be in the hospital for two to four weeks and then out for two to four weeks and then back in so it was literally in and out and then a new drug came out two years ago um, that's changed everything and I hit 30 I was never supposed to hit 30 years old but I turned 30 this year and that that new drug is called Trikafta has given me like a new lease on life. That's what gave me the energy to start doing YouTube in any capacity at all to start streaming. And when I, when I started streaming the console drops, I found a way where I could do something positive to help other people. And that's what latched on to me about it. And I know I'm not like, you know, curing the disease or anything like that. I'm just helping people play video games. But again, like you were saying, you know, video games can be such an escape from what you're going through. And what times when I was stuck in a hospital bed, I could still have an adventure through gaming. So it means a lot to me. Um, and actually I'm doing a live stream tomorrow, um, December 23rd from 1 PM to 11 PM Eastern where 100% of the pro proceeds YouTube has linked it to the cystic fibrosis foundation goes directly to there. I did it last right. year as well. We raised thirty-five thousand dollars in eight hours, so we're going ten hours, and we're going to see if we can top that this year. But out of everything I've done, you know, out of over a hundred thousand people I've helped get a PS5, that's the thing that I'm I'm, I'm most proud of. And it's not even me. Yeah. The the thing about it that's so special is it's it's the community that found me. It's people that got their PS5 or Xbox, and and some people that haven't even gotten it yet. And still are going right, to come right, right. and donate, and that's just—it's just incredible, and it, it, it gives me a lot of faith in the world. But the reason I said the thing at the very beginning—I'm I'm wrapping this up. I'm so sorry. Um, that's okay. Is <laughs> thanks, Josh. Um, is because I think about when my mom was told that I would live to be only 10 years old, and I think about all the parents of CF patients today being told about the disease. And I, and I want them to know that their child can live a full life, even just with the treatments that are out there now. But I want that to one day be cured. I don't even want to cure for me. I want to cure for everyone that comes after me. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing your story. I appreciate you highlighting the communal aspect of gaming. And I look forward to continuing this conversation on your 60th birthday. I don't want to see you till then. I got a lot of work to do. But when you turn 60, you give me a holler and we'll keep talking. Jake Randall, I, will, I appreciate sure. you making time for us tonight. Please do. Thank you very much, Jake. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. What does home for the holidays mean when your home is the White House? America's first families have kept up their Christmas traditions even in hard times. Presidential historian Michael Beschloss takes us back before we go. Imagine you lived at the White House and you had to plan this year's holiday celebrations. How would you do them? That question has come up every year for generations and the answers have told us a lot. 
The holidays are a chance to put politics aside and let lawmakers get into the spirit of the season. And that's the focus of the latest episode of Fireside History with Michael Beschloss. That series is streaming now on Peacock. In this episode, we meet LBJ, Lucy Baines Johnson. Her father was President Lyndon Johnson. She explains why her family stayed in Washington on one particular Christmas. Well, it, it was our last Christmas uh, as uh, um, a part of a first family. And, and so uh, my father was attuned to the fact that as much as I think he really wanted to go home to the ranch and get the comforts of home, that uh, the White House had become home to a lot of the rest of his family. He could sense that, that uh, being in that home on that last opportunity that we would ever have to be there was important. Joining us now is NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss. It's always good to see you, and I want to kind of dive in Same. with this picture well, I love of Harry Truman. Congratulations Trump. on the great show. Oh, I, thank I you. love the show, thank learning all the time from you as usual. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. And I, I, I started watching this episode of Fireside History and wanted to pull out a few things in the time we have, particularly this picture of President Truman with his mother-in-law. I kind of like the fact that even for the first family at the White House, that sometimes some of the old challenges of Christmas, being president does not absolve you of them at all. It doesn't at all. And if you look at that picture, the mother-in-law is on the left. She can't, she detests her son-in-law, Harry Truman, even though he's president so much, she can't even stand to look at him. And on the right, you see Truman, who's looking about as anxious as I think you and I have ever seen Truman in a picture. You really get a sense of, uh, he was not exactly enjoying uh, a meal with his mother-in-law. And unfortunately that was his experience during Christmas. And actually it was also true in 1945. Truman was a new president. As you know, he was dealing with things like the end of World War II and what you do about the atom bomb. His wife, Bess, felt left out. He didn't include her in what he was doing. And she was furious. She went back home to Independence, Missouri. And so finally, Truman flew back out to see her on Christmas Day with an armful of presents. And she was not too nice. And he wrote her afterwards, you looked at me as if I were something that the cat dragged in. So uh, just like the rest of us, presidential families have got problems. And there's only so much you can do when you're president to kind of keep the struggles of the world, the, the troubles of the world at bay, right? I mean, you know, the Pearl Harbor was attacked three weeks before Christmas, December 7th, 1941. Yep. Churchill was at the White House Christmas 1941. You've got Carter who decides not to light the White House tree one year because there are still hostages being held, said he was going to hold off on lighting the tree until the hostages came home. That standoff took a very long time. So there's only so much, you know, we learn from the special that presidents can do to just have Christmas and lock the rest of the world out. Yeah, that's for sure. And, you know, Joshua, you know the number of times that presidents and Christmas and first families, it seems almost treacly. You know, they have a wonderful time always, and they're always gathered together, and they all love each other, and they're posing for pictures. You get behind the scenes, and just like the rest of us, they, they are dealing with traumas themselves. For instance, I, I talk on the show to Susan Eisenhower, the granddaughter of Dwight Eisenhower, president of the 1950s, and I said, why did your grandmother Mamie, why was she so fanatical about celebrating Christmas in such a big way? She started doing it almost in October. And Susan said, well, we never said it when she was alive, but the reason for that was my grandmother and my grandfather, the president, lost their first son, whose name was Dowd Dwight, died at the age of two of scarlet fever, and that happened at Christmas time. And so for the rest of her life, every time Christmas time came, she wanted to do a big thing about celebrating Christmas to blot out that horrible personal memory. Before I have to let you go, we've seen the celebration somewhat evolve over the years. There started to be a Hanukkah celebration, a Kwanzaa celebration. For many years, right. the biggest ornament in front of the White House was the tree. Now there's a red ribbon for World AIDS Day on December 1st that some administrations right. have put up. Do you see the commemorations continuing to evolve, or is this kind of the extent of it, to kind of keep it in a somewhat more traditional no, I, vein before we go? 
I love it evolving because for most of American history, we just have to say it, this was largely a white Protestant holiday as it was celebrated by white pro Protestant presidents, all male for a very long time, uh, for most of American history. And only amazingly enough, uh, for instance, the first president to light a Hanukkah menorah was Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter is still alive. That was not very long ago. Kwanzaa and other holiday celebrations have now took place. We celebrate the diversity of America. And for younger people, they think, well, that's just something that happens all the time. All I can right. tell you is a lot of Americans for centuries felt left out. NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss, thank you so very much. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And you should remember to check out the latest episode of Fireside History, Holidays at the White House, streaming now on Peacock. Hey, thank you for making time for us so far as we've launched. Safe travels to you if you're hitting the road. We are off until the first Monday of the new year, January 3rd. Come on back and do bring a friend. Stay in touch with us over the holidays. We're at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also email us now tonight at NBCnews.com. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Merry Christmas, a joyous Kwanzaa, Happy New Year, and good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.